Stanford University. Well, nice to see you all here again. I heard, actually, while I was in Asia last week, that the presentation uh, by Mike Snyder went very well, so I'm glad to hear that. And today we're going to move from the host um, to actually a population uh, that is more numerous uh, on each of us and in each of us than our own host cells. Uh, I mentioned in passing uh, at the very beginning of this course that actually microbes are more numerous on our bodies than actually our, our human cells. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to begin to delve down into this companion uh, that lives with you and on you and through you uh, for all of your life, does lots of good things, and then also creates a little bit of havoc. Obviously, we're all pretty focused on a virus these days, uh, H1N1, and we could talk about that uh, perhaps later. But um, there are many wonderful things that happen by way of microbes. There's an interesting book that I um, recently read read um, by Stephen Johnson, who writes some sort of popular science, and this one was called The Ghost Map. Uh, and I'd recommend it to you, particularly after Julie's presentation, it's the story of cholera uh, around the 1850s in London, and it's as much a depiction about microbial host interactions as you're likely to witness in a very thoughtful and uh, somewhat provocative way. And one of the interesting points that he makes in passing and I don't know whether Julie will agree with this or not, is that if you were to, in essence, wipe out all the mammals uh, on the world, in the world today, it wouldn't really change um, the world's biodiversity. But if you eliminated the bacteria, uh, you'd wipe out the world in pretty short order. Um, so the bacteria, which are the oldest uh, of our evolutionary species are really critically important and the topic uh, of Julie Theriot's um, work. Now Julie, uh, who's going to be our speaker tonight, um, comes to this uh, by way of an interesting background. Um, she actually co-concentrated, uh, received two degrees from MIT, one uh, in physics and the second in biology. Uh, and then kind of fuse that as she moved to her graduate work at UCSF uh, where she concentrated on cell biology and really became more interested uh, in microbes, which has really um, been the story of her own research uh, career. Uh, and she has not forgotten her roots because she's really combined physics and computation and biology and lots of other tricks and trades along the way uh, to become really one of the world's leaders uh, in this field. Um, she's currently an associate professor in biochemistry and microbiology and immunology, uh, but is also the recipient of some enormously distinguished awards, even at this early stage of her career development, including a MacArthur uh, Foundation Award. And you know uh, that's meant to be just for that small population of geniuses, and uh, I think she um, certainly achieves that, uh, that title. She's also uh, been elected to be a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, so another distinguished accomplishment in what I know is going to be a continuing uh, legacy of great uh, achievements. Uh, she's highly recognized as a teacher uh, to our medical and graduate students, and I'm very pleased uh, to have Julie speak with us tonight. So. Well, thank you, Phil, for that very nice introduction. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity uh, today to come here and talk to you about the uh, microbes that live inside of all of your bodies. Now, um, I came to a couple of earlier uh, incarnations of this uh, in previous weeks, and I noticed that uh, this is a very interactive group, and you're very curious, and you like to ask questions in the middle. I want to strongly encourage you to do that. I can't tell you how happy it is how happy it makes me to get questions when I'm in the middle of talking because that way I know that you're actually listening to me. So please uh, don't feel at all shy about stopping me and asking questions in the middle. Now the, the task that I was given today, um, and in fact the title that I was given uh, to discuss with you, is this concept of, of the world within us, uh, specifically to talk about the microorganisms that live as part of our bodies and are critical uh, both to our normal functioning, our normal physiology and our normal health, as well as uh, causing disease. Now I'd like to start off just with a naturalist's observation. This was made by Jonathan Swift in 1733. He said, so naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. 
This image, of course, is an electron micrograph of a flea, which is a common parasite of mammals, including humans, dogs, rats, many other mammals. And uh, it's also one of the organisms that's responsible for spreading some kinds of human diseases in populations, most notoriously for spreading the bubonic plague. Normally, rats uh, are covered with fleas, but when uh, the fleas started giving the plague to the rats, the rats would die, and then the fleas would hop off the rats onto the nearest convenient mammal, which in cities would tend to be a human, and thereby spread the plague through cities. Now, my distinguished colleague Stanley Falco, who's a emeritus professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, early in his career was studying bubonic plague, and in order to study the way that the bacterium that causes bubonic plague, that's Yersinia pestis, actually goes from one mammal to another, it was also necessary that he study how it survived inside the fleas that carry it around. So Stanley very proudly cultured a colony of fleas, and he was very fond of his fleas. He would feed his fleas carefully every day and take very good care of them. And then he became very sad when he noticed that his fleas seemed to be sick. So he took his fleas, although he was very fond of them, he had no qualms about killing them, and put them under the electron microscope to see what was going wrong with his, with his pet fleas. And this is the picture that Stanley took at the time. This is now the leg of the flea, and you'll notice it has smaller fleas that on it prey. These are mites, and it was a mite infection of his flea colony that was causing the fleas to become sick. Now that's remarkable enough, but one of the things that I'm particularly fond of in this photograph is that, at least those of you in the front row, if you look very carefully at the surface of the mites, you'll see these little specks just right on the surface. Can you see those? Yeah, so those, those are bacteria, and those are bacteria that are living on the mites. Now my group, as Phil mentioned, studies bacteria, and if you look very closely at bacteria, so here now these are a couple of E. coli cells, this is the outline of the bacterial cell, and these long extensions coming out of it are flagella that enable the bacteria to swim around. But if you look very closely at bacterial cells, you'll often see that they too have little parasites. In this particular case, this was an experiment that was done by one of my graduate students where she deliberately added these little specks you might just be able to see in the micrograph to the bacteria actually to infect them. These are bacteriophage, which are a particular kind of, of virus that only infects bacterial cells. And here, this is a much higher resolution electron micrograph where one of these little creatures here that looks like the lunar landing module uh, corresponds to one of these little specks here. So we've gone from the flea to the mite to the bacterium to the bacteriophage all the way down as Jonathan, Jonathan Swift predicted. So I particularly just like to emphasize that when you think about any particular organism on Earth, uh, for example, when you think about yourself and your own body, it is the natural state of affairs that you'll be covered with smaller and smaller fleas and so proceed ad infinitum. Now, in particular, in the case of the human body, as Phil mentioned, you know, we tend to like to think of ourselves as being individual organisms. And I know when Mike Snyder talked with you last week, he encouraged you to think of yourself as a single coherent organism that has one genome, where that genome is replicated in all the cells of your body. Well, Mike was right about 10%. But only 10% of the cells in your body actually have human DNA in them because the other 90% of the cells in your body aren't human at all. They're bacterial cells, they're fungal cells, or they're protozoal cells. Now, the exact numbers you'll see, different kinds of estimates, the number of human cells in the human body are thought to be about 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 14th. The number of bacterial cells, primarily with a little smattering of these other kinds, is about tenfold more. So, rather than thinking of yourself as being an individual organism, it's actually much more appropriate to think of yourself as being a complex and thriving ecosystem of which the human cells are only a minority. Uh, question? How much is it by weight of bacteria? Okay, that's an excellent question. So the bacterial cells are very, very small. And typically, an average bacterial cell that inhabits your body is going to be between 1 100th and 1 1,000th of the average weight of one of your human cells. So overall, it's somewhere on the order of a few percent of your weight is made up of bacteria. But if they were a democracy, if every cell got an equal vote, <laughs> then the bacteria would win every time. Now, does anybody have any idea where the highest concentration of bacteria in your body is to be found? Yeah, so when you, uh, when you produce feces, actually a big old chunk of that is bacteria that are coming out of your lower intestine, which is where the highest concentration is. And uh, there, you know, you probably can estimate what volume or weight of feces you produce every day. You'd say probably about 30% of that is bacterial cells, and you can do the calculation yourself then to figure out how much of your body weight that represents. <laughs> so uh, in this context, I'm, I'm uh, particularly moved by this quote from Walt Whitman's uh, Song of Myself, I am large, I contain multitudes. So uh, as you walk around, just remember you're never alone. 
Um, you always take your, your whole ecosystem with you. Now, most of the people in this room, I assume, even though you're completely covered with bacteria, they're all over your skin, all over your mouth, all through your digestive tract, you're probably reasonably healthy. And actually, to a first approximation, having those bacteria as co-inhabitants with your body is important, is necessary for maintaining health. And as we'll see also for performing certain functions, particularly in the digestion of food, that you're not really that good at doing with just your own human DNA. So what I'd like to talk about today is going to be divided into three parts. In the first part, I'm going to uh, try to introduce you to the microorganisms that live on your body. Now, you're, of course, intimately familiar with them in one sense, but probably don't know that much about who they are and what they're doing there. So I'll start off with that. And then, uh, whereas we're going to start off focusing on the benign microorganisms that we live with all the time, obviously an interesting and important aspect of bacteriology as far as medicine is concerned is those few bad actors the rare bacteria in the world that cause disease in humans. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about our current understanding of how disease-causing bacteria or pathogenic bacteria are different from all of these many, many trillions of benign bacteria that cover us all the time. And then finally, I'll move on to talk a little bit about how human cells and how the human organism interacts with both the helpful and the harmful microorganisms. And this will be a little bit of a segue into the, the talks that are coming over the next couple of weeks from Dr. Gary Skuldick and Dr. Lucy Tompkins, who will give you different kinds of views of the interaction between uh, humans and microbes. Now, I'm a cell biologist. My training is in cell biology. So I tend to think of humans and indeed all organisms on the planet as just being big piles of cells. And here today, I'm, I'm representing the bacteria, if you will. So I'd like to start off by putting bacteria just sort of on an equal footing um, with all other organisms and all other cells. So humans, uh, remember, it's about uh, you know, 10 to the 13th cells or so. Um, and as you know, those cells are quite specialized to perform different functions. But if you look very, very closely at any particular part of a human being, you can easily see the granular structure that makes us up. So this, for example, is a thin section through a human kidney, where each one of these open white circles is an individual nephron, which is where the urine is formed and is filtered. And then around the outside of each one of these things, you see there are these little squares that have a circle in the middle. These are kidney epithelial cells that are involved in absorbing and, uh, and secreting salt and water uh, to form the urine. So each one of these little round spots is a nucleus, and that has an entire complement of the human genome in it. And you see the cells cooperate together to make these nice rims around the kidney tubules. And if you were to look in any of your favorite tissues in the body, you'd see a similar set, sort of organization where lots of cells are working together. Now, the other major prominent multicellular organisms on this planet, besides animals, are plants. And plants also are basically a cellular structure. In fact, it was originally uh, Robert Hooke describing the tissue of plants, the structure he saw under the microscope, where he coined the word cell. And this is just to show you the cells of a plant. This happens to be from a leaf, where you can see the outline of the individual cell here. And all of these little red bodies inside the cell are chloroplasts, with the, which the plant is using to do photosynthesis. But again, it's just a big old pile of cells. Now, because we ourselves are macroscopic organisms and our eyes are able to only see things that by absolute standards really are quite large, we tend to think of the planet as being inhabited largely by big things, by animals and plants and maybe the occasional fungus. But in reality, as Phil alluded to, almost all of the living creatures on this planet are in fact microscopic. And most of them are unicellular. Now, many of those unicellular organisms are eukaryotic cells, like us. That is, they have their DNA carried in a nucleus. We'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about the, what, what specifically is meant by eukaryotic cells. But I'm just giving you some examples here of what some of our relatives look like who are not multicellular. This is tetrahymena, also known as pond scum. Any of you who uh, were in the habit of uh, taking samples out of the creek in your backyard and looking at them as a little kid saw lots and lots of tetrahymena swimming around. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or baker's yeast, or brewer's yeast, which is very good at converting sugar into alcohol uh, for our own pleasure. <laughs> this Emiliana huxleyi is a very interesting unicellular organism that's a, a coxolithoth sorry, coxolithophere, which um, causes algal blooms out in the ocean. And these things can be spectacularly large. You can see them on satellites from space. There was a recent algal bloom in the North Atlantic that was actually the size of the state of Alaska. And it was just made up of many, many um, trillions or quadrillions.